You are listening to Open Democracy. Hi and welcome to this week's episode, a special look at migration and the media. Later in the program, we'll talk to Nasreddin Nizam of Solomon Magazine in Athens, and to Mohammed Shabat of Bainana, the first magazine set up by refugees in Spain. But first, Barbara Flood is in London to meet Usama Gawish, an Egyptian journalist who joined the Refugee Journalism Project in the UK. He tells Barbara about how the project works and why it's so important, not just for individual journalists, but for the quality of news and media overall. But this is still an area where we have a long way to go. A study in 2020 by the European Journalism Observatory about U.S. and European migration reporting between 2015 and 2018 found that while 26.6% of articles do feature migrants and refugees as main actors, 18% cover them only as large anonymous groups. A mere 8% of the articles feature migrants and refugees as individuals or families. Very few migrants and refugees featured in the articles are actually quoted. The media quoted 411 migrant speakers compared to 4,267 non-migrant speakers. This really puts into context the necessity for initiatives like the Refugee Journalism Project. So let's get into it. Gawish starts off by telling Barbara how he first started in journalism. I wasn't a journalist in Egypt. I was a political activist and I was a dentist, a professional dentist. And then after the military coup in 2013, I fled the country. And in Turkey in 2013, I met with some of my friends who were political activists as well. And we want to do something to our friends, to our country. So we went with some Egyptian businessmen and we decided to launch an opposition TV station. And at time, I started my journey as a journalist. Okay, so it was in Turkey. Yeah, it, it was in Turkey in um, the, the start of 2014. I started working as a producer and then I did a camera test and the pilot and then become a TV presenter and then the main TV presenter in the TV station. And I presented the secret audio leaks from inside the presidents of Egypt, or Fatah Sisi, and they called me in the Middle East, the leaks presenter. The, the military regime in Egypt, they sentenced me five years in absentia. They put my name in a military trial and they banned publication. So I have no idea about the charges of this military trial. And they put my name as thousands of Egyptians in the so-called fabricated terrorist list. So they panned uh, my, um, deactivate my Egyptian passport. They uh, prevent me to renew it or have another or a new one. And they put my name on the interval list in Turkey. So I fled Turkey again to the United Kingdom and sought asylum in 2018. Okay, and so when you landed in England, just to explain to people who aren't from a refugee background, it doesn't really matter if you've got like 30 years in journalism and you have the, the most fantastic credentials. When you arrive in Europe, um, are they recognized or what, what's the story? No, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. I was lucky because I secured a job in Arabic. But in English, it, it was um, difficult to just introduce yourself to the industry because the language barrier is the first thing the refugee background, the second thing, and your um, speaking is not fluent. You are not a native speaker. So this is another problem. Until I met um, the Refugee Journalism Project in 2020. So it's an initiative by London Communication uh, College. Um, and, And they offer us, the refugee journalists, offer us a one year training with them. We meet with experts from BBC, from Bloomberg, from The Guardian, um, and they introduce us to the industry as qualified professional journalists who want another chance. 
And this was amazing because the people start to teach us how to pitch idea, how to do a freelance working, how to do um, a podcast, how to create your podcast, your own podcast, how to pitch your podcast to uh, industry to get paid. So after that, I um, they introduced us to mentors. My mentor was a prominent journalist in the United Kingdom, and he helped me to publish my first ever freelance work with The Guardian in 2021. And it was amazing for, for me. And it's open um, many opportunities as a freelance with Media Diversity Institute, with Middle East Monitor, with the, the Middle East Eye. And I'm now doing this freelance regularly. Mm. So it, it, it was great to just put us on the right start. This is how to start in the industry. This is how to pitch ideas. This is how to create your own podcast. What was the name of your mentor? Just it's Ian Dant. And I want to thank him. He's editor in large in Politico. Cool, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, Vivian Francis obviously set up the project. Um, she was a journalist herself and didn't realize that the, what barriers people from refugee backgrounds face when they got here. And that's why she set up the project. So it's like... It's amazing, and and you were you were probably on one of the first years of it then, were you? In twenty twenty, because it's not set up that long. I think we were the third, third, one. third year of the refugee journalism project, or the second. I'm not sure, okay. but no, we we met with our uh, participants, our friends, our old participants. Uh, for example, Abdul Tahoun. he was the first year of the refugee journalism project, and he has his own podcast too is about refugees he is from syria he was an english teacher and he helped us to just explain how we can benefit from this initiative he's brilliant yeah, yeah. i love his he podcast is. he is he's yeah. great that yeah. yeah so what do you think was like one of the best things about the project okay i i think the first thing yes you can this is the first rule they, they teach us you are a professional journalist you have adding value you can do it. You can be a professional journalist here as well in the United Kingdom. So to build our self-confidence again, because, you know, we came through a difficult times with um, a, a wide mental health issues. So they just build our self-confidence. This was the first thing. The other thing is to guide us when and how and where to start again how to pitch ideas. Before the Refugee Journalism Project, I was thinking that to write an op-ed or any um, report or feature to the Guardian to end with, just write the whole thing and send it. And during the project, there is something called pitching ideas. It's a 200 words, how to pitch your idea, how to introduce yourself, how to introduce the main, the key features of, of your idea. So this was the first thing. I used to listen to podcasts in Arabic and English. But I had no idea how to create my own one. I'm now presenting my own podcast. And thanks to the Refugee Journalism Project, I attended three or four um, intensive workshop with people who are podcasters in the BBC and other platforms who teach us how to do your podcast, how to use equipments, how to do the script and everything. So this was the second thing to guide us how and where to start. The other thing, and it was a very important, the fellowship program. I attended six month fellowship with Hot Topics, three months, and with journalism.co.uk for another three months. Working in the industry, attending the editorial meeting every day, writing articles, writing features, uh, moderating sessions in English, for these six months, it's, yeah, it, it sent me a message that you are now I'm a professional journalist. You are now doing journalism in English as well as in Arabic. I'm doing journalism in Arabic since 2013. But in the last two years, with the help and support from the Refugee Journalism Project, which is continue until now, yeah, I, I can do more in English. That's brilliant. Why do you think it's so important for refugees themselves to be writing and producing material? Not only about refugee stories and migration stories, but, uh, you know, why is it important to, for, for people with that background to be in the media? I think the diversity is, is, is very important in newsroom because people here in, 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 in Europe, in the United Kingdom, they only knew about the Middle East and other countries 
um, superficial things. They don't have the, the, the capacity to dig in these communities. But we came from these communities. We know about the cultures, we know about the problems, we know about everything, about economy, about politics, about traditions. So I, I think it's important to have these voices in the newsroom, to have this diversity issue, to have this flavor of we can talk about Egypt, not only about arms sales between Boris Johnson and Abdel Fattah Sisi. No, we can talk about the tourism sector in Egypt from an Egyptian voice. We can't talk about captagon trade in Syria from a Syrian refugee. We can't talk about the problem between Shia and Sunnah in Iraq from an Iraqi refugee. We can't talk about the horrible things in Afghanistan and the decline situation for women in Afghanistan from a woman refugee from Afghanistan. It's better to do it. Yeah, good, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Just to finish off, i just wondering, have you got any advice for journalists who are not from a refugee background, but are covering uh, migration stories or that, that area. Have you any advice for them? Yeah, just consider the mental health issues because this, these people suffer a lot from their journey. Don't push them to telling their story. If you feel they are not comfortable, just stop there because it's hard. They may cry. They may have a, um, a panic attack or a mental health. You can increase the mental health issues. Just stop there and don't. Don't push them hard on this point. The other thing, not consider them as only victims. Try to ask them about their successful stories. Because they have. They have successful stories in their countries or here in their new countries. Put them only in the victim angle, it's hard because it's, it doesn't help them to just rebuild their self-confidence. And the, the third point is just try to explain that they are welcome in the new country. They are welcome in the new community. They have a lot of friends here. They have a lot, a lot of organization in the journalistic career and other careers that may welcome them and offer them a job. So I, I think they, they need the, the, the early days of any refugee in this country. They need a precious thing called hope. In any hope about the home office, about the community, about the government, about the friends, about the, the, the house, any hope, any kind of hope. They are living. The only thing keep them alive, it's hope. My name is Nasruddin Nizami, and um, I originally come from Afghanistan as a political refugee. I live in Athens uh, since 2010. Nasruddin Nizami is co-founder of the online magazine Solomon in Athens. What is Solomon? Yeah, yeah. It's a non-profit organization, a media organization that uh, we use, uh, Solomon use uh, media as a tool for the uh, integration or for the migrant refugees, uh, right, and for uh, of refugees and migrants. We write uh, very separate, we are not um, even the government or NGOs, or we are very, uh, like, anaxarte, we say in Greek. Uh, independent? Independent, yeah. yeah. And uh, we write article. that's why the reason that Solomon, I joined it, we start very s small uh, a group of uh, migrant refugees, Greek and lo with locals, and with just like okay, we will not like become a professional or other colleagues. But now we have office, we have like a professional journalism that our colleagues work. I'm the board member and the uh, community commu communication uh, officer. And as you went to our website, uh, we awarded from different kind of, because our, like, Moria book, we got it awarded. And uh, our article, we have a lot of, uh, our reader is a lot, also in Greece, but uh, in especially in the other EU country in America also. 
And sometimes I help in articles, in research. Not always, but uh, I try to my best because of the time, as uh, yeah, yeah. I mentioned. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, what uh, we like uh, should be uh, independent. Uh, and we should write um, the truth, what's happening, what's going on, uh, the situation of the people. Yeah, this doesn't matter. We are we write also about Greek people, about the local. I mean, but we have cooperation with the. Yeah. It's a good mix. It's good. It's good. This the art that I read that you had your you had the research was the one about the Musafir houses. Musafir Khana. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, like uh, for anyone who doesn't know, just a quick description of of this kind of phenomenon. And it, it's in a lot of countries. These houses where it's like. 50 people living in a couple of rooms. Yeah, the idea was mine. And I think this uh, is is exists in other European country, in Germany yeah. and um, France yeah. and uh, UK also. Yeah. Okay, someone is coming this country, even with the document, they apply for asylum or undocumented. But you have to help them with language or accommodation. And that was the reason that we thought that it's a good idea to write about this, how the people is uh, in the situation. Mm. And um, it was uh, took long time that we do this research and then we write an article with the colleagues. Yeah, because you're seeing that obviously in your work every day, uh, people's situation. Yeah, I mean, in also, uh, always the topics, like now is the Ukrainian topics in the front page. It will be like one or two months and then we'll be like finish okay that's all uh, in afghanistan i mean was topic in august just two weeks in the front line of a tv channel newspaper uh, solomon that says we don't want that we want to say that something like uh, continually like uh, to always be like focus on this issue and to describe and to write That was Nasruddin Nizami of the magazine Solomon in Athens. Another media outlet set up by refugees is Bainana, which is Arabic for Between Us. One of the editors, Muhammad Shabat, talks to Barra online and Osama Gawish interprets. Before the, the, the revolution, before all this happened, we were um, Arabic teacher. Our studying was about IT, technology, and so on. And then when the, the war started, the circumstances forced us to do journalism, to do some um, covering and um, working as a reporter uh, from a conflict zone or a, a war zone, just writing some news and covering some some issues and some crises, and then doing a freelance journalism with a plenty of news outlets. <laughs> Okay, in 2011, they will start in, in, in the university. No one of these uh, four uh, journalists had finished his um, universal study. Okay, and the authorities, because of their participation in the revolution, in the, the, the protest against the regime, they dismissed them from the universities. So they found themselves in the streets without studying without university and then they start their career as journalists as a reporters people really relied on that information here at the time to get proper information because obviously the journalists weren't allowed into the country so i mean that that citizen journalism was really vital at that that stage there is two reasons for um, this career shift to be a journalist for Muhammad and his friends. The first one, it, it was a limited number of Syrian journalists who cover the revolution, who cover protests, who cover the, the, the civil war. And another thing is Western reporters and correspondents, the Syrian regime didn't allow them on specific areas in Syria to just cover what was going on there. So it, it was easier to them just to go and cover this news. 
Um, I mean, that's a real baptism by fire, as they say in English, like you're just learning on the job and also learning in very difficult like circumstances, um, how to be a journalist, so, like full respect for for doing that. أكيد نحن دخلنا بالمجال العملي مباشرة، نحن ما ما درسنا الصحافة دخلناها مباشرة، كان تعليمه هو عبارة عن من خلال أصدقاء زملاء تعلمنا من yeah, he said we struggle a lot at the beginning, we didn't study journalism, we just study with practice, we study with our friends' experience, our journalists' experience, we monitored them and learned from them how to do this, how to do that, we um, struggled to find a proper equipment. To, to do, but however we overcome this, we did uh, a short documentaries, we did uh, reports, we did features, and so it, it was like, yeah, um, experience with practice, we, we never heard about the academic uh, study of journalism, however we, we did a lot of stuff, and this helped us in Spain, in our new experience in Spain, to just yeah, benefit from this all practical experience in journalism, on the ground in Syria, to just launch this initiative in Spain. Was Benana, was that your first option or did you want to work in newsrooms in Spain? Or what was the situation when you got to Spain? هلا بصراحة نحن وصولنا كان لإسباني هو عمل شوية ضجة بوسائل الإعلام الإسبانية خاصة بظل قلة تواجد صحفيين سواء كانوا لاجئين When we arrived, we were 12 journalists and photographer from Syria who arrived in Spain for the first time. So we were a breaking news at time. All the media in Spain talked about and discussed that there is a 12 Syrian refugee with a journalist background just arrived the country. Because in compared to the United Kingdom, in compared to any other European countries, Spain, it is not the country who welcome uh, many Syrian refugees. So according to the uh, official statistics, there is a limited number of Syrian in Spain, according to uh, Mohammed. Another thing is when they arrive, they start um, talking and writing on social media about what's going on in Syria and just to make the, the, the things in Syria um, no, well known in Spain. So the people in Spain knows more about what's going on, on on the ground in Syria. After that, they were four people in Madrid and they discussed between, um, they discussed together how to do an initiative to talk about immigration and refugees and asylum seekers in Europe who fled um, Syria. So the start uh, between us or by Nana uh, in Spain and Arabic, and they studied um, Spanish language first, so they can write and speak Spanish as well as Arabic. Why is it important, do you think, for refugees to own their own narrative, to tell their own stories? This was the, the biggest goal of this initiative, Bainana. Journalist refugees from Syria who are talking about other refugees in Syria, so they feel the suffering, they know how it's hard to be a refugee, what's the meaning of fleeing your country, what's the meaning of lifting everything behind, and starting from scratch in a new country with a new language, with the new people, with everything. So, um, Bainana, or Between Us, it was the first journalist initiative in Europe launched by refugees themselves to talk about refugees. So it's a unique initiative, as he said, and also every time Spanish media just try to discuss the immigration or, or refugee crisis, they host a guest, um, a Western guest, who talk about a problem they've never know about it, they have never lived it, they have never experienced what the meaning of, re of refugee or, or asylum seeker. Uh, for example, Islamophobia, if they are talking about Islamophobia, just host an expert or academic or whatever to talk about Islam, and he's not Muslim, he doesn't know anything about Islam, he doesn't know anything about the problem of this issue and what the, the, the challenges Muslim facing in, in, in Western countries. So it, it is the same, the best way to um, discuss refugees, to bring refugees to talk about their own experience. So this is the, the, the main reason behind the Bainana. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned there the mainstream media and Islamophobia, but like, is there anything else, like especially around migration and the way that media cover it, that really stand out to you as 
really bad practice. موضوع العنصرية بشكل كبير بإسبانيا هو من أحد المواضيع المثيرة المثيرة للجدل لأنه في شغلات كثيرة هي تعتبر So, for example, the racism in Spain, it's, it's um, a popular in, in, in the mainstream media. And for example, the far right and the leftist uh, newspaper or um, leftist media or far right media in Spain, they always um, give a reason. an explanation this is not racism against muslim this is not racism against migration it is a spanish people rights to do this or that so um, this is not fair because um the 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 best one who knows about if this is racism or not is a victim so just to host the victim to talk about if if it's refugee or muslim or whatever just bring them to the mainstream media and they will explain it well الناس مو عارفه شو هو القانون شو هي القوانين السبب الاصلي انه الناس ما بتعرف انه الهجره هي حق شرعي لكل مواطن كل انسان موجود but the problem is he said the people in Spain they don't know about the law the migration is a, right, a legal right for anyone around the world who suffer from uh, poverty, who suffer from instability, who suffer from security problems or war zone or whatever, it is a legal right. It's a humane right for anyone who want to travel, who want to find safety in another place. So he said refugees are not poor or dirty people. They are well qualified. If you just provide them with the proper facilities, with a proper education, they will work, they will gain money, they will... be an added value in any country. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Could you tell me just briefly about one story or one one thing that you worked on that you published that you're very proud of or that was very important? There is a plenty of stories we, we publish and we are proud of. A few stories about um, Syrian refugees struggle in Spain. Okay, and the bad um, attitude from a non-governmental organization in Spain who dealing with refugees. We publish about their stories and they are start dealing with them probably. And the, the, this was a good point because they complain, uh, Syrian refugees complain about these problems and we publish it and then the problem uh, was solved. So the, this was one group. Another group is about a music group from Morocco. They, are, they were refugees, and we publish about their story. And the Spanish television contact reached uh, Painana and asked to um, put, them, uh, put them in a contact with this music group from Morocco. And they host them in the television. And they host one of the Painana staff to discuss how they reach out to this group, how the, what is the Painana initiative, and so on. Um, another um, story, it's about the comparison between the Ukrainian war with Russia and the Syrian war, how the, the, the media um, covered this and the comparison in human aspects and so on. And the plenty of ministry media and newspaper published this and referred to by Nana. Brilliant. Yeah, that's, that's a really good piece to be getting out there. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for journalists Who, journalists who are of refugee background or migrant background that want to be journalists, do you have any anything that you've learned that you want to pass on? I mean, there's the obvious ones, I suppose, learn the language and that kind of thing. But is there anything in particular? From my experience, I faced uh, many challenges. So, in a few points, the first thing is hope. Just, yeah, keep your spirit up, and there is always hope in the new country. And uh, rebuild your self confidence. You can do it. You can be a journalist again in your new country. And uh, don't listen to the negative messages like you not uh, be able to do this. There is a language barrier. The language, it is not a barrier. You can learn, you can study, you can speak the new language. It is not a big deal. And also the integration with the new community. It's a very important to just to know about the culture, know about how they are working. So it will facilitate your mission to work as a journalist in the new country. And the last thing, just keep working on your uh, mother country. 
you are fleeing Syria, so keep talking about Syria. Keep talking about what is going on there, because the people there, they need the international community to know more about what happened there. Brilliant. And, and you're an expert, because you're from there and you understand the situation. Definitely, and I'm reaching out to a different audiences who had no idea about Syria. Brilliant. Yeah. No, that's really good. Thank you for that advice because I think it's good to get to get that out. Thank you. Shukran. But um, was there anything you wanted to add that I didn't ask you? كثير غطت على الموضوع لأنه كانت هي البينة هي أول تلك هو أول وسيط إعلامي أسس من قبل من قبل لاجئين. Okay, he, he explained that by Nana it's, it's just a one-year uh, project without any uh, huge or major fund from any institution or whatever, or group, or, or it, it's just a personal initiative, and they are funding it from their own pocket, and they have uh, family duties, they have the... the, the, the the life duties every day in a new country. However, they insisted to just uh, keep going with with Bainana to just reach out the Syrian voice to 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 the international community. Um, and uh, yeah, the the main purpose is just yeah deliver the message of Syrian people to the whole world. They announced the subscribers system, uh, monthly subscription to just have the, the, the um, access to the whole content uh, of Bainana. So they, they hope this will fund them as an initiative to just yeah keep keep going. Is that on Patreon? Patreon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That was brilliant. Thank you. Shukran and Islamo. على راسي على راسي والله ماشي تشرفنا تشرفنا شكرا يا محمد شكرا جزيلا حبيبي وسام شكرا لك الله يخليك يلا سلامات سلامة سلامة You have been listening to Muhammad Shabat of Bainana in conversation with Barbara Flood and interpreted by Usama Gawish Thanks to Osama for all his help on this episode and for telling us about his own media experiences and the refugee journalism project in London at the start of the program. His podcast, Untold Stories, is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks also to Nasruddin Nizami, co-founder of the magazine Solomon, and of course to Muhammad Shabat of Bainana the first magazine set up by refugees in Spain. Thanks too to Omar Al-Kilani, who wrote and performed our theme music. Links, as usual, with the show notes. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to I Am Not Your Refugee, Produced by Barbara Flood and myself, Mahmoud Hasino. Funded by the Pulitzer Center. You've been listening to a podcast supported by Open Democracy. If you liked it, please consider making a small donation to help us do more. As a small media organization, Open Democracy relies on the backing of people like you to keep going. Go to opendemocracy.net now to support our work. And one more thing, to avoid missing out on future episodes, don't forget to subscribe to this show in your favourite podcast app.